<laughs> Estamos nuevamente aguardando. We are waiting for Patricia. É, a Mike está no canal de inglês, está escutando essa. Mike, essa nossa... are you in the channel? Are you are you listening to this preparation? Yes. Oh, they want. Yes, I'm following. They want you. Yeah, they want you to say if you're are following the, the preparation. I see that on YouTube. That is good morning. They they are greeting people over there. We are going to start soon. It's the message on YouTube for the participants. And the participants are wishing each other good morning. É, pessoal, acho que a gente precisa começar, né? I believe we need to start now. Bernardo. So, Bernardo, if Patricia does not come in after the presentation, the floor is yours. And then I can stop. So, Patricia gives her, her morning welcome. Maíra, Fernando, I believe we can start this presentation live now. You can turn off your camera. If you're not presenting, please turn off your camera. Então, te dá um para gente, né, Fernando? Não está aparecendo lá ainda. A gente já começa gravando, Maíra, ou só depois que eu der o recado? Desde o início. Desde o início, né? Recording in progress.
Bom dia. Good morning. Welcome to our event, the second international webinar of Hydrogen Certification. I am José Slotkovic, coordinator and consultant at NIAS. Before the official welcome and opening session, I have some technical instructions for you. I have the pleasure to be the moderator on this session, so I will coordinate questions and answers among the participants and presenters. And we wish you all a great discussion today. I will start sharing my screen now. So as I mentioned, I am José Slokovic. Feel free, you can call me Zeca if you want to. And today, we are having a diversified event and I really would like to see your questions coming up, you participants on YouTube, and you can use the chat on the right hand side of your screen. This event is being recorded and will be on HHK, Rio de Janeiro, YouTube, if you need to leave and see you later, it will be there, available. And we have this event in English, we have English Channel because we are having simultaneous translation on this channel. English and Portuguese, you choose the language of your choice. So, without further ado, I'd like to invite Bernardo Dor the coordinator of components of GIZ for the opening session. Bernardo. Thank you so much, Zeca. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second international webinar about hydrogen certification. I am Bernardo Dora and I work at GIZ as component coordinator in the project A2 Brazil. This project we are having this event today. I will talk about GIC, it's a public company, German government working in different countries, implementing technical projects. And H2 Brazil is one of these projects, part of the Brazil and German operation implemented by GIC in association by the Ministry of Mines and Energy, Brazil. On the German side, this project is funded by the Federal Ministry of Development, BNC, that is the German counterpart. And the general objective of A2 Brazil is to improve the structure, the necessary conditions for the development of a green hydrogen economy in Brazil. In addition to having this component for development, studies, knowledge on planning area, energy, regulation, finance, certificate, the project works in different areas, components, outputs, as we call it in GIC, qualifying a network of multipliers, developing educational objectives, implementing green hydrogen centers with MEC, Senai, the federal institutions, working, strengthening up the ecosystem, innovation, with innovation competition among startups, fostering research development in association with the universities. You saw some of the uh, our activities. This project is big and it's bold, total volume of 30, 40 million euros is starting the second semester 2021, and unfortunately is closing by the end of this year. And this component that I mentioned studies, planning, regulation, working with certificate as well, that is the topic of today's webinar. So we can deliver all the activities with quality within the term estimate for this project. We had in the very beginning an international tender and the consulting near us was the winning consulting responsible for studies and measures like the series of webinars that we're having right now. The topic of the certificate, we are going to see 
webinars. And this was a very assertive decision that we had with Nidas in the beginning of the project. The topic, as you are aware of, is very dynamic. We had in February some important definitions from the European Union, the Delegate X. And with this format of webinars, we can discuss and work in a dynamic and interactive way, all these developing topics in the sector that is very challenged, always ongoing evolution. And it's possible thanks to a very competent group of collaborators, advisors, not only at NIRAS, important partners like HK Hill, ZSC in German and P and MML, EPL the contributors to putting up this event together today. Without further ado, I'd like to wish you all a great webinar and I pass the floor to Zeca. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bernardo. Our co-host, MMA, is already here in the waiting room on Zoom. Please, AH key, uh, let her in. As Bernardo said, the program is performed by GIZ in association with the Ministry of Mines and Energy and also the important presence of our representative of MME for her initial considerations. I'd like to invite to the floor Patricia Costa, the Secretary Advisor of the Executive Secretary of the Ministry of Mines and Energy, the coordinator of the norm and framework at the National Program of Hydrogen. Patricia, welcome. The floor is yours. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. Zeca, I am Patricia. I am in the Ministry of Mines and Energy. I'd like to thank you so much, GIC and Nidas, for the invitation, the participation of this webinar. I am in MME, in the ministry, and we have a technical team and also energy team supporting us, following up this work. Felipe followed these discussions and the structure of these programs of hydrogen, especially the certificate program. In this ministry of energy and mines, we have a great interest in the energy transition, just to update you to this beginning of the government, we had a change in the institute. The secretary of planning is now the secretary of planning and energy transition. These are some priorities that we have over here. And talking about this association with Germany, this project, Hydrogen Brazil, we have a partnership between the governments in Brazil and Germany. And this certificate aspect, we are treating it within the national program of hydrogen, especially the framework about certificates. And within the PMA2, that is this discussion ongoing between the parties, private sector, public sector, the academia, and we are bringing actions and certificate. And we open a tender that uh, finished the last week. And then in parallel to that, the associations with GIC, the Project A2 Brazil, bringing great support to define some things and also for the technical structure of all these systems. I wish you all a great discussion. And we have lots of great presenters here, special presenters. And later on, we're having more discussions and more opportunities to discuss and deep dive this topic. I wish you all a great discussion and we see you later. Thank you so much for your opening considerations, Patricia. Let's move ahead and we get to know more the sequence of a workshop coordinated by the program H2 Brazil. And for that, I'd like to invite my colleague Felipe Andres Toro, leader at NIRAS, and the colleague Han Anthers in Cobis, director of energy transition of H HK Rio de Janeiro. Felipe and Anthers, welcome. 
Good morning, Zeca. Thank you so much for this invitation <laughs> and the excellent organization of this webinar. Zeca and all my colleagues. Good morning, Angskar. And if you want me, I can start sharing my screen because I have a brief presentation for you. We can see it. Okay. Come on, man. Really, this is really, really. I have a nice. brief introduction, really and, then, and then I pass the microphone to Anscar. This is really. This fun. is a brief introduction. I'd like to remind you that we talked about it on the first webinar last year in May, and then we had about a hundred participants from the industry and the associations in Brazil and some international members. And we talked about three key topics after the presentations. We had the task force, as we call them, with the industry. And then we talk about additional criteria on renewable energy consumption for the hydrogen production, and also coordination in geography and electric system, and then next talks. As we say, uh, something additional, additionality is one of the important topics is the granting for all the sources in Brazil that are granted sources, and how to grant a full disclosure for the carbon footprint of credits. Also about the certificate, including a process to storage and transport. This was discussed in that group and i reckon in brazil could be a tool to ensure the origin especially because of this time implementation one hour and this is in the pilot phase so also about the geographic relationship and electric system capacity we talked about generation inside could be a block for the certificate in brazil and how we can remove the competitiveness to use and produce uh, green hydrogen and the electricity costs. The criteria to generate energy and produce a two in the same market is interesting because the transmission is easier and the self-production model could also be a way of proving the origin. We have uh, agreements registers in CE, binding agreements, and the measurement uh, by the CCEE. Off-grid option or on-grid option to produce the hydrogen should not be mandatory, so we can have different modalities of business. These were the conclusion that we had back in that discussion. It was May 2022. Water consumption to produce hydrogen for this topic, there was just one participant and it was a very limited contribution. But this topic we have been working and studying last year and we know the importance of this uh, substance so we can have a potential study. The next topics that we would like to discuss and analyze and we are going to present next slide and this we talked about 35 and granting for this kind of certificate. And it's possible to bring solutions and adapt to the Brazilian regulation. And then we could generate energy to the northern area, producing hydrogen in the south. This is a question, a topic that were registered by the reporters in the meeting. And the same for water use, for the green energies are important. The availability of water, what kind of definition uh, that is going to be important here. And these were the results on the first webinar. So we have to present here and now in a very brief way, we have series of webinars about the certificate in 2023. We have the 
dates proposed. March 7 is the second webinar and the objective for today's sessions, I believe the most important is to have an exchange of news, what's new and important points of the guidelines of European Union and how this is going to affect the approaches and the certificate systems of hydrogen, the green hydrogen and low carbon hydrogen for Brazil. I believe this is very important to have this approach for these two types of hydrogen. Also, we have the possibility of having representatives from Europe, but also Brazil and get a feedback their opinion about private sector and these criteria for the certificate and if they are doable or not. And I believe this is the main point for today's session, March 7th, 2023. We have more three webinars estimate. Next is going to be April 25th, 2023. The focus for this would be the certificate for exporting purposes. And then we are going to work about the case studies, the certifying beginning, and also exporting cases in Chile, Haruoni. And after that, we are going to work on May 23rd, 2023, the Brazilian experience on certification design. We would like to invite you all. We have a Renova bill, CCEE, for the hydrogen certificate. And finally, June 19th, 2023, we would like to invite you all so we can talk more about the certificate procedures. And this is based on another study ongoing already with the DCR here in Brazil also for the project A2 Brazil. What is the plan for today? Here we have today's agenda. We had the welcoming considerations from the ministry with Patricia and Bernard. Thank you so much for that. Now we have Anska talking about the motivation for this series of webinar. And thank you so much for AHK for cooperating with us, Niras as well, for this series of webinars organization. We are so pleased to having the support from you. And also these interactions that are very important for the Brazilian industry and German industry present in Brazil. And the main presentations will be the first one I'd like to briefly introduce Mike Smith from the Institute of Hydrogen, Stuttgart. And she's going to talk and present about the current discussion and the certificate, what's the latest new, the latest analysis. And also, thank you so much for Giselle, Mauricio and his team for bringing a presentation, 30 minutes about the status quo of trends and impacts of this European certificate and the Brazilian model. So thank you so much, Excel. It's a great partner, a lot of hours, very important for our project, for the regulatory aspect. And finally, we would like to invite Ricardo Gebra, the Trading Chamber of Electricity, CCE, is going to present more about all these discussions in the Chamber for Hydrogen. And finally, we would like to invite Euler Lage from ANP so he can bring his closing remarks so we can conclude our reflection on today's event to conclude it. So thank you so much. I believe that I, now I will pass the microphone to Zeca, the moderator. Thank you so much again. And the floor is Angers. Now, Angers, please, the floor is yours. 
Ok, thank you so much, Felipe, Zeca, Niras, for letting us host this event that is so important. We have had this first moment before. Last year it was May. And I believe that in that moment it was one of the first discussions that we started about certificate, hydrogen certificate in Brazil. And if you have been following this topic, you know that a lot has gone and we have since that point, the first certificate and the first version. And I believe that Ricardo will explain it better. And it's very important that Brazil works this topic with intensity as we are doing it. And you know, in the end of February, a week ago, we had the first phase of subscription of Global H2 program, German government that export hydrogen to Germany generally speaking, right? And this could only be done through a certificate because the buyer, not only the German government, any buyer wants to know if the hydrogen that they are buying is generated without or the quantity of carbon negotiated. So this certificate is very important. The discussion is very important. The improvement of this discussion. Conjunto dessa certificação dizer, nacional brasileira com as certificações ou com as regras de certificações. With the international certificate. Conjunto com o CCE para. Contribute to CCE to. In January, for this certification, we prepared a letter in German, which can be downloaded today at the CCA webpage, especially to participate in the H2 Global. So this is a provocation from our side to try to force this discussion about the subject. And there's a lot to discuss. There are a lot of opportunities. Uh, and this is very important to discuss the subject because this serves the purpose uh, as input as well to allow us to improve this certification, uh, the national certification that we have, because Brazil has a lot to contribute with this new economy, uh, this hydrogen economy and the energy transition, uh, because uh, in the end of things, uh, the European countries, and I'm talking here on behalf of Germany, cannot generate as much hydrogen as is necessary and is necessary for the country. So they'll have to buy hydrogen from other countries. And, and we need to know what's the uh, carbon content purchased with this hydrogen and that's why the certification is required and there's a lot of things to develop there's uh, a lot of things to do with the certificates and just doing a breakdown uh, which molecule must be attract to know how it's going to be in the mixture so there's a lot of things that are still open to discussion but i'm pretty sure that the discussions that we're starting today with the series of webinars uh, will really contribute a lot for this purpose. So I wish a lot of success for the, uh, the discussions here today. And now, Zeka, the floor is yours again. Thank you, Ansgar and Felipe, for uh, the context you just gave us. I would like to reinforce uh, here uh, for the 150 participants that are following you on YouTube, that you can send your questions on the chat room and we'll have this discussion moment with the participants. So please feel free to contribute with this debate as well. 
Uh, I would like to invite now Mike Schmidt. She is the leader of the system analysis department at ZSW, uh, which is the English uh, acronym for Hydrogen and Solar Power Research Center. Mikey, welcome. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Seca. Um, can you see my Seca. screen? Uh, yes, we can see. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for the invitation and I'm very happy to talk to you today and give you some insights of, from the EU discussion on uh, hydrogen certification. And uh, just to make sure that you understand why the EU is so strict in their regulation on green hydrogen, I want to start with the background of the European Green Deal. Uh, the European Green Deal is from the year 2019 and it aims at transforming the EU economy for a sustainable future. And it should make Europe the global leader in the fight against climate change. And it should make Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050 at the latest. It includes supplying clean, affordable and secure energy, mobilizing industry for a clean and circular economy, accelerate the shift to sustainable and smart mobility, but also preserve and restore ecosystems and biodiversity, just to name a few goals of the European Green Deal. And of course, it needs a financing um, instrument. So the financing of the transition is also part of the Green Deal and it should be a just transition. No one should be left behind in this. And so the Green Deal is a really big program and Europe is really proud of it. But the European Green Deal will not work without green hydrogen. And I want to show you, using the example of Germany, why achieving climate neutrality is not possible without green hydrogen. Here you see the primary energy consumption in Germany in the target path. You see the year 2019, which is the start we, we are starting from, the year 2030 and the year 2045, because Germany already wants to become climate neutral five years ahead of the EU. Um, but I think this does not really matter because the main objectives are the same for countries in Europe. Uh, either they had for climate neutrality in 2045 or 2050. So the first stage is um, a massive expansion of renewable power production and electrification wherever technically and economically feasible. And the second stage is then introducing green molecules like green hydrogen and hydrocarbons based on renewable power, water and CO2. Otherwise, it is not possible to reach a climate neutral um, economic system, neither in Germany nor in, other, uh, in any other country in Europe. So this is why green hydrogen is such a big deal for the Green Deal in Europe. Europe has a hydrogen path and um, its hydrogen strategy aims at a production capacity of 40 gigawatt in 2030. This is a relatively old goal already. The EU also already has standards for lo low carbon hydrogen and climate neutral hydrogen in their EU taxonomy, which is a guideline for financing uh, and for uh, um, uh, financing institutions where to uh, lead their money to. And third, the production of fossil-based hydrogen is already regulated under the European emission trading system with a current carbon price of around, around 90 euro per ton. During the last weeks, we already reached 100 euro per ton. So there is a lot of regulation from different um, sites already in Europe. So this is kind of complicated. And another thing that we already have had in place when we started the Green Deal is the Renewable Energy Directive 2, where biomass as a source of renewable hydrogen is already allowed. Because there's a definition of biogas and this says biogas means gaseous fuels produced from biomass. Hydrogen is the gaseous fuel, so hydrogen produced from biomass can be seen as biogas. And in the context of the Renewable Energy Directive 2, 
hydrogen from biomass can be accounted for as advanced biofuel for the transport sector, but only if the bio, uh, the bio, uh, the hydrogen is based on uh, raw materials you see in the list down here. So this is almost uh, only residues from other production processes. So it's um, if you uh, produce hydrogen from biomass from one of these sources like the gas or biomass fractions of industrial waste, then you have hydrogen in the uh, definition of biogas of the Renewable Energy Directive 2 and you can have it accounted uh, in, the, uh, in the regulation of the Renewable Energy Directive 2. But um, in the life cycle analysis, you have to uh, reach 70% greenhouse gas reduction compared to fossil fuels. But I think this is possible, so maybe this is also an option for Brazil. And this is already in place um, far, far before um, we had the discussion on the delegated acts. We see the new targets of the Repower EU project, uh, program with a binding target of 45% for renewables in the energy mix by 2030, uh, much higher target than before. We see a sub-target for re renewable fuels of non-biological origin or RFNBOs, um, including renewable hydrogen for transport by the year 2030 of 5%. We see a sub-target for renewable hydrogen and RFNBOs for the industry by 2030 of 75%. We have the goal of 10 million tons of domestic renewable hydrogen production and 10 million tons of renewable hydrogen imports by 2030. And we have an increasing target of sustainable aviation fuel, including a sub-target for synthetic fuels in the aviation sector. And this is 0.7% uh, RFNBOs in the year 2030 and 5 in the year 2035 and running up to 23% of RFNBOs. NBOs. So this is the new situation where the delegated acts come in place. And the EU Commission presented the rules for the production of green hydrogen and renewable fuels of non-biological origin in two legal acts on February 13th. Now, within a two-month period, and this can and probably will be prolonged to four-month period, the EU Parliament and the EU Council either have to agree or disagree to the delegated acts. If they agree, they come into force at April 10th or June 10th this year. If they disagree, then the EU Commission has to go back to the tables and uh, discuss again. But in the character of the delegated acts, it is said that there is no consultation, either with, uh, neither the EU Parliament nor the EU Council, nor any other um, authority is allowed to get into a discussion process. It's only the EU Commission who has a right to um, come forth with the Delegated Act, and then the, others, uh, the other two um, authorities only can say yes or no. So there's uh, no option for Brazil uh, to get into the discussion anymore. Um, either the delegated acts will come into force because the parliament and the council agree or they won't. From the parliament, I've already heard that they will agree at least to the delegated act for green hydrogen. If they agree to the delegated act for the CO2 sources, this is not clear right now. From the council, I have no information right now. Renewable hydrogen is a crucial, crucial part of our strategy for a cost-effective energy transition and helps to become independent from fossil fuels from Russia and various industrial processes, said Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson when she announced the two delegated acts. Clear rules and a reliable certification system are crucial for this emerging market to develop and establish itself in Europe. These delegated acts provide investors with much needed legal certainty and will further strengthen EU industry's leadership in this green sector. So now you know what is the focus of these delegated acts. There are 
um, main aspects discussed in the delegated acts for green in the delegated act for green hydrogen. This is the temporal correlation or the simultaneity of power generation and hydrogen production. This is second the geographical correlation or the no grid congestion between power generation and hydrogen production. And third, it's the additionality of renewable power production. Before I get into details, I want to show uh, one further success uh, or big success, I would say, of the discussion before the Delegated Act come, came out. And this is that the guarantee of renewable origin of the power production can be certified via a power purchase agreement. So there, um, this is, I think, a very uh, good idea um, to uh, give the guarantee only by power purchase agreements and no other um, aspects that have to be taken into account. And I think that for, um, so the power purchase agreement would um, function like that the elect uh, electrolysis plant uh, or the, electro uh, the hydrogen producer needs a, um, a, tr a treaty or a power purchase agreement with a, a, a power producer who produces elect uh, green electricity and so they have their treaty and there it's said how much uh, electricity is uh, bought and maybe also in which hours it is bought and this, uh, this is enough to guarantee the renewable origin. But coming to the uh, different criteria, geographical correlation. Maybe you wonder why Europe um, really discusses about geographical correlation. And I tell you why. Europe aims at an interactive internal energy market with free exchange of electricity between member states. And they are afraid that the production of green hydrogen could counteract the achievement of this goal. So this is why they come, came up with the criterion of geographical correlation. On the right, you see the bidding zone system within Europe, which, which shows the different zones where uh, electricity can be traded within Europe. And this is uh, the, uh, something the Delegated Act refers to. So the geographical correlation means that the electrolyzer and the renewable power production unit have to be located in the same bidding zone or they have to be located in neighboring interconnected bidding zones where the day ahead electricity prices for the same hour are higher or equal than in the bidding zone where the electrolyzer plant is located. Or third option, the renewable power production unit is in an offshore bidding zone adjacent to the bidding zone where the electrolyzer is located. In addition, member states within Europe can introduce additional rules to avoid grid congestion or to support their own grid expansion plans, but I think this is not relevant for importing countries. Uh, or, um, but there is um, a regulation within the Delegated Act for this uh, fact, and it says where reference is made to bidding zone and imbalance settlement period, period concepts that exist in the Union, but not in all other countries, it is appropriate to allow fuel producers in third countries to rely on equivalent concepts provided the obje objective of this regulation is maintained and the provision is implemented based on the most similar concept existing in the third country concerned. This uh, sounds complicated, but in case of bidding zones, such concept could be market regulation, physical characteristics of the electricity grid, uh, the level of interconnection, or at last resort the country by itself. And so I think the geographical correlation should be not the main problem for um, Brazil uh, exporting hydrogen to Europe. Temporal correlation. Why are we talking about this? With, uh, Europe is in fear that without temporal correlation, the production of hydrogen could lead to a higher production of fossil-based electricity and thereby higher greenhouse gas emissions in market situations with high electricity demand and low renewable generation. This is why um, they came up with the criterion of temporal correlation. Temporal correlation means that the electrolyzer and the renewable power production unit have to produce within the same calendar hour in a, in a within the same calendar hour. 
there will be a transitional phase until the 31st of December 2029. And in this phase, the production has only to take place in the same calendar month. This should be pretty easy to fulfill. Um, the other options that are sh shown here for temporal correlation, I think they are not relevant for Brazil or other third countries who want to import to, Rio be to Europe because it's very special um, and uh, re it refers to the market situation within Europe. So I think it's only the um, correlation that within the same calendar month until 2029 and afterwards um, within the same calendar hour, it has to be proven that electrolyzer and um, renewable power production take place. Additionality. Why additionality? I think there was a lot of discussion about that, but most countries in Europe still have significant amounts of fossil-based power production. And to meet the climate protection goals in Europe, the transition to renewables has to, has to be continued and accelerated without any hindrance. And to avoid that the additional power demand for electrolysis indirectly leads to a higher power production of fossil-based electricity, the additionality criterion is introduced. There are two options. Either the renewable power plant is directly connected to the electrolyzer or it is uh, connected to the grid and then to the electrolyzer. So I will talk, talk about the direct connection first. So if the renewable power plant is directly connected to the electrolyzer and the renewable power plant has no connection to the grid or the renewable power plant is additionally connected to the grid, but a smart meter shows that for the production of hydrogen, no power is taken from the grid, then additionality in case of direct coupling means that the renewable power plant comes into operation not earlier than 36 months before the commissioning of the electrolyzer. This is the additionality criteria. An additional production capacity for the electrolysis can be added within a period of another 36 months. And also um, the uh, power plant can be a repowering plant, maybe a wind turbine or a, another, um, or a hydro power plant. Um, and the repowering is then uh, illegal if uh, it is uh, the investment is higher than 30% of the initial investment. Then this is seen as a new um, renewable power plant, and then this is illegal for the additionality criteria. If the uh, renewable power is purchased from the grid, then it must be strictly verified through power purchase agreements. As I've shown before. And in this case, additionality means that the renewable power plant comes into operation not earlier than 36 months before the commissioning of the electrolyzer. Same with the uh, um, with, uh, direct connection. Also the same that uh, additional production capacity of the electrolysis can be added within another period of 36 months and repowering is illegal. And another aspect is here that the renewable power plant must not have received op OPEX or CAPEX aid, or the aid has fully be repaid. Otherwise, it's not additional uh, power, uh, it's not accepted as additional power. Um, if the installations uh, um, of the electrolyzer and the renewable power plant come into operation before January 1st, 2028, they are exempted from the verification of additionality until January 1st, 2038. This means that before January 1st, 2038, they only need a power purchase, purchase agreement to prove that they purchase renewable power. And after this date, they need a power purchase agreement to prove that they purchase renewable power from additional renewable power plants. So this is a transi transitional period to allow um, a faster um, grow up of the uh, or faster growing market, faster growing market. There are two exemptions from the additionality criterion. The first one is the CO2 intensity of the electricity mix. Um, if um, no, there is no need to prove additionality if the electrolyzer is located in the bidding zone where the emission intensity of electricity is lower than 18 gram CO2 per megajoule or 65 gram CO2 per kilowatt hour. 
in the previous calendar year. And if this is the case, then this exception applies for five years. If you look at this map, then you see um, and the uh, below 65 gram per kilowatt hour is the yellowish color. There are not many countries in the world applying for this, uh, which could apply for this exemption. And um, this also means that you still need a power purchase agreements on the amount of, elect uh, of renewable electricity, which is consumed for the hydrogen production. And you have still to stick to the rules for temporal and geographical correlation without any change. So this does not mean that countries like France or Sweden can use their nuclear power to produce hydrogen. So the, because you still need this power purchase agreement and you still have to show that you um, uh, produce the hydrogen with the green electricity that you have purchased um, temporally and geographically correlated. So um, green hydrogen will still be green hydrogen from green electricity. The second exemption is um, takes place um, if there is a higher share of 90% in the electricity mix. Um, there's no need to prove additionality if the electrolyzer is located in a bidding zone or whatever equivalent we have in different countries, where the share of renewable electricity is above 90% in the previous calendar year. The exemption then applies for five years. Um, the only thing that you have to have in mind is that the hydrogen projection is then limited by operating hours correspond corresponding to the share of renewables. The limitation is calculated by multiplying the share of renewable electricity by the hours of the year. Example, if the share is 92%, the operating hours are limited to 8,060 hours per year. So I think this is not really a limitation because there is periods where we need, you, need, you need downtime for the electrolyzer for maintenance. And uh, if you can have it producing 8,000 hours a year, then this is uh, full time. So I think there uh, does not result any restrictions from this rule. And you do not have to prove any temporal or geographical correlation if you have this more than 90% uh, of renewable power production in the country. And as you see in the graph below, uh, with a share of 92% renewables in 2020, this exemp exemption applies for Brazil. And so you do not have to worry about temporal and geographical correlation. You do not have to worry about additionality as long as you keep your electricity share um, above 90%. This was everything. Um, uh, about the uh, electricity of about the delegated act to green on green hydrogen. Um, I have a few more slides upon the second delegated act referring to um, the CO2 sources. And um, this uh, second delegated act defines criteria for CO2 being used for the synthetic carbohydrates, e.g. methanol um, or um, sustainable aviation fuel. And um, what, which is very, what is very important is that it uh, looks at the life cycle um, of the production, uh, from the production until uh, the use of the, um, uh, the fuel. And there you uh, uh, taking any um, greenhouse ga house gas emission source into account, um, the savings from the RFNBO or hydrogen which is produced has to be at least 70% uh, related to 94 gram CO2 per megajoule for fossil fuels. And um, in addition to that, there are uh, some um, extra criteria, some are only for the EU, uh, relevant only for the EU, um, others are uh, also relevant for other countries. So the first one that uh, sources of um, CO2 is subject to the European uh, trading uh, 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 European trading uh, emission trading system can only be counted as avoided if they continue to pay the CO2 price 
I think is not relevant for Brazil, um, but that capturing of the emissions from non-sustainable sources for energy production can only be considered as avoiding emissions until 2035 may be relevant. And also that for unavoidable CO2 sources like cement industry, it can only be considered as avoiding until 2040. So this is a very short time span for um, uh, making investments. I don't think that this is an opportunity. Uh, this offers an opportunity for CO2 from industrial sources. Also, um, for the uh, unavoidable CO2 sources, the um, uh, calculation mechanism for the 70% greenhouse gas savings um, is uh, difficult to achieve by the cement industry. They will not reach the 70% savings. So, probably the CO2 source um, cement industry cannot be harnessed for. Um, for the production of RFMBOs. Uh, only CO2 from the direct air cap capture and from biomass is allowed. And if you look at when I tell you that you have excellent biogenic CO2 resources, such as the bio, these could easily be tapped and used for hydrocarbon production. So I have to uh, use uh, to um, uh, produce methanol from these CO2 sources together with green hydrogen and then export this to Europe. So from my perspective, the conclusion would be that Brazil is in an excellent position for both producing and exporting green hydrogen and RFNBOs like methanol or sustainable avi aviation fuel to Europe. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, eu vou falar agora em português, pois a Mike pode escutar. I'm switch to Portuguese so Mike can hear in our channel, in our transition channel. And I can read a few of the questions that we have received here on the in the chat room. Again, I would like to thank the more than 100 participants that are following us on YouTube. We have seen, uh, have uh, gotten several questions. I'm going to Due to time restraints, I'm going to combine a few of the questions and some of the other questions that arrive us, uh, they can be answered in our next presentation by Giselle. Mike, the question is if energy coming from the Brazilian power plant, that water that surplus of water that does not go through the turbine, but could go through the turbine and generate electricity and be converted into the hydrogen. Is this hydrogen green? And then the combination with another question, if there is a relationship of the time of the power plant was built for this requirement of additionality, what about a practical case according to the recent published ratio? Um, according to the first question, um, if additional water, which is now not used for power production, but then um, would be used for power production, um, if this could be green, um, I think this depends on um, other aspects which might have to be taken into account if this overflow water, which is now not used, is maybe necessary for um, uh, environmental reasons. I think that if um, then you use it for hydrogen production, it will not be declared as green just because there are um, would be these other aspects of environmental impacts. But if this is not the case, and you could just use it to enlarge the electricity production, then this would be green. And um, for the second question, I would ask you to uh, just ask again, because I didn't get it fully. OK, the, the question was okay. about between the time that the, the, the plant was built. And so it's regarding to the additionality, regarding to the uh, three, uh, three years of uh, start production. Okay, the um, 
the definition means that um, or we have this 36 month period um, where you can already build the uh, electricity production um, plant and the electrolysis plant is not yet in place. We have this because uh, in Europe we have very long uh, periods, uh, planning periods, and um, therefore it's not, uh, uh, or you cannot be sure if you start planning of renewable power production and electrolysis at the same time that then the reno renewable power production will be in place when the electrolysis is ready for starting. This is why there is this 36 month period before the electrolysis started where uh, renewable power production is allowed. Um, but you could now start planning a renewable power production plant um, and you will build it and then you decide when it's done uh, that you want to combine it with an electrolyzer and if this is built within uh, 36 months, then this will be additional. I hope this answered the question. I'm not sure. Okay, I think. Oh, obrigado, Mike. Eu acredito que Thank tenha... you, Mike. I believe you have answered both questions properly. And if you have further questions, we are still receiving on chat on YouTube. But I'd like you for. I'd like to invite your final consideration, so we move ahead for next presentation. Mike, the floor is yours for your final consideration. Uh, from my point of view, um, it's a very good uh, start now that we have the delegated acts. I hope that the EU will uh, come up with uh, deciding um, that they can come into force. Uh, the latest in June and I think that with the workshops that we see here and uh, then we can refer to it and uh, adjust the Brazilian um, certification system to that so I think that uh, Brazil has excellent chances to um, import green hydrogen or export green hydrogen to Europe. Okay, thank you very much Mike. Uh, muito obrigado, Mike, pela, pela... Thank you so much, Mike, for your contribution. I hope you stay with us so you can listen to other debates, other panelists. And now I'd like to invite Gisele Tim, represented by Mauricio Moscovich, senior investigator of Gisele, electric study at Rio de Janeiro University, and his colleague Adeli Branquinho, researcher at Rizel and director of ICT Rizel. I believe that in our presentation we can approach some of the questions placed here on chat as well. I would like to ask my colleagues AHK bring on the screen and I pass the microphone to Mauricio Moscovitz. Thank you so much Zeca for the invitation, Felipe, GIZ for the invitation. AHK, we are so honored to participate of this honorable group. And we plan to bring a point of view that is alternative on the certificate topic based on our reality. If we reached our reality, and then Adeli will complement some topics about certificate mechanisms. So our next slide. Initially, I'd like to introduce a summary. We're having a brief presentation at GESEL, the national context of the Brazilian electric system and other aspects, certificate aspects, and in the end, final considerations so we can help uh, in this reflection upon the certificate. Next. Gesell is one of the main think tanks in the electric sector in Brazil, coordinated by Professor Castro for 25 years. A group of 168 workers organized by a technical body with interface with different universities. private and extensive academic production. All the academic production at GSL 
can be accessed with no cost, free of charge. All the articles, books, and text, everything is free of charge, easily accessed. Next. And then there is a relationship of activities and the informs currently we are in the inform 6600 and you divide it by the working days we have long lasting informative maybe the longest one in the Brazilian sector, very strong presence in social media, communicating all these topics. And next slide, we are going to focus on hydrogen. One more. In this slide, let's get back one. We present the projects that Giselle is engaged developing infrastructure, uh, a platform to analysis the storage, transport, and final use of hydrogen. We are developing this project with the Brazilian company, GNS, connected to Siemens Energy, also working, performed with PCIN, opened the first plant of hydrogen in Brazil, just a showcase 25 megawatts and then we are advancing on the roadmap to keep the technical and economic aspects environmental and legislation all these development of the strategy to communicate hydrogen in brazil and with felipe seri zeca and gic to develop a framework, a regulatory framework and comparison projects to learn from successful experience from other countries. Next slide, please. And here, the inform and reports. I'd like to tell you that Giselle has specialized informs and reports that is a report that is weekly issued about about a green hydrogen and one more report and inform a document that we issue every six months and that is an observatory interpreting the news and all the aspects about the hydrogen in all the media that we can access the observatory is an interpretative analysis of what's new in that period of time. And you can access this document if you enter Giselle website. After this introduction, I'd like to talk about the national context. The national context is very interesting. As Mikey mentioned, Brazil has very interesting characteristics considering electric energy in our electric matrix not the energy matrix but the electric matrix in brazil this is the dream that all the countries want if you consider 2021 even during water crisis we generated around 77 percent of the energy from renewable energy even in a year such as 2021 and this estimate number is stable when you estimate 2021 up to 2030 considering the energy 10-year plan 2022 and then you observe that 77 80 84 percent of the energy produced comes from renewable sources. This is our electric matrix has an important characteristic when we think about hydrogen economy. And here talking about the potential, when you talk about potential, Brazil is rich 
In wind energy, we have higher capacity with the winds, with the dominant direction. And then again, we have a perspective of advancing the wind production when you consider offshore. And then we realize that the offshore aspect is important and also license and permit. And you see 180 gigawatts of projects under the process of permit and license in Brazil, November 19, November 22. From zero, we reach 180 gigawatts of projects licensed, dominant in the Northeast area, but also some opportunities, good opportunities in the Southern and Southeast region. And then we have the same condition of the sun energy in different sites of Brazil. And if you consider just uh, the areas, 28,000 gigawatts of capacity peak to be installed. And as Mike said, also the topic of biomass, 380 giga terawatt hour on capacity of generation. So this data is very important for this potential, helping us to think about Brazil and its importance of the hydrogen economy, considering that 70% of the hydrogen cost comes from the electricity. So if you consider the situation 70% and you see the conditions of energy generation, renewable energy in Brazil, you realize that Brazil is an important area and it must be heard and listened into the certificate aspect. Here we have evidence on what I'm talking about to show you that this is not theory. When you have a bidding, an option of energy, for example, A plus for bidding process 2022, if you see more than 107, 1,700 projects of sun energy, biomass, and wind energy registered. So we have just a demo and also hydraulic aspects, hydroelectric central. If you consider this aspect that is around 1,894 projects and 75,000 megawatt on capacity offered to the system, so these projects exist, they were registered, they serve criteria on the agencies that the agencies that register the project. So it's very important to consider them, to consider this existence and the potential to become projects. We have seen already this demo case that is very important of our capacity of bringing projects on renewable sources, showing the regions, the dominant regions where these projects were offered. And in complement, if we have these projects of generations, but we also need a transmission network that is capillarized, so we have 150,000 kilometers of transmission line high tension, just to give you an idea, four times the, if you go around the world passing through Ecuador, it's something really important. The estimate of expansion of 33,000 by 2031, 17,000 to start in 2026, investments coming ranging from 51, 126 billion, depending on the scenario to be considered 
in the PD 2022. This is very interesting, the aspect big projects of renewable energy associated to a transmission system that is capillarized. When you see this map and you see gaps in the northern area, it's because of the density, populational density of this region is low, and there are problems of environment preventing the transmission lines from going on in this area. But the other areas you see capillarized the transmission line. Next. And here I'm reinforcing the previous aspect on emissions. The electric sector is responsible for 10%, 11% of the emissions of CO2 in Brazil. Green gas effect. And this value is going to be stable. So this aspect shows that as it's being presented, that we are ahead of what's practiced currently, considering European community, our emission rate is 37% of the emissions of the European Union. 27% of the American electric sector, 15% of the Chinese area. And it's important to consider when Beni will show the flow chart of certified, keep these numbers, we keep these numbers, 
go based on this discussion and the certificate. We have standards of certificate for carbon intensity, hydrogen chain, and by products and flexibility mechanisms to adjust the specification. So this topic address the components and everything is well programmed in this horizon of a three year plan. Next, please. And then I'd like to open up the floor to Adeli, associated researcher at Giselle, senior researcher, great experience at the NDS analyzing and fund projects and infrastructure. And I believe that she's the best person to bring this next topic, certificate, Deli, please. Good morning, everybody. My approach about certificate will be intermediary point of view. I will show the certificate later, according to Mike, and then before Ricardo Gera, I believe we have the European aspect and we have the national aspect under development with already advanced, that is a manual of certificate in Brazil. And we see that is in synchrony with certify. I will talk more about it during my presentation now. The certificate of hydrogen, the guarantee of origin, is a priority for the countries that want to train hydrogen, even the ones that are going to consume it internally, especially the countries that want to sell it. They must be certified for that purpose, synchronized with the potential buyers. There are different countries developing certificate programs with criteria representing sustainability, life cycle evaluation, comparability, governance, with clear roles and responsibilities of each and every entity, part of that institutionality of the certificate, transparency, clear conditions on nonconformity, auditing, verification, and certificate granting. This is very important. Everything must be audited. So you can issue a guarantee of origin and tracking and control that is also important and is vital because from the point that you issue a guarantee of origin, it must be transferred to the buyer of the energy, hydrogen, and after the transfer, it must be canceled. So it cannot be used more than once. This is fundamental. Let's talk more about certify and read to especially these documents that were recently issued. Just to remind you the certify aspect when Ricardo Gera presents it, he's going to mention the adherence of our model to certify. In certifying the hydrogen part from renewable part could be defined as the participation of the renewable energy use and total energy using the production process. It's something that is closely related to renewable energy on that batch. How does it happen? You do not see my cursor moving anyway. In this quarter here, I believe people know about it. We see certify in this square here. That is a benchmark of 91 grams of CO2 per megajoule. And this benchmark is a benchmark of best available technology when vapor and uh, methane vapor is issued. So this benchmark of 91 grams is defined. It's the threshold. So a batch of hydrogen is analyzed. Let's call it this way. If that is 100 grams, it cannot be analyzed. And then, 
you define 60% under this benchmark. And this 60% corresponds to 38 grams of CO2 per megajoule. This is the threshold to certify the hydrogen in green or low carbon if that is in this region is not certified, not even green or low carbon. Next slide, please. Okay, Adelie, I'll just ask you to please be brief due to time restraints. Yes, I'm gonna be real brief. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I uh, just mentioned, just to clarify the situation, there's a decision tree for the certification criteria from the certifier. So if the average emissions are lower than 91 grams and there's a renewable energy in the mix, X renewable and minus X, not on one, one minus X, re not renewable, the renewable portion will be assessed. And if it uh, the emissions is less than 36 grams, it's green hydrogen because it came from a renewable uh, part of the energy and it's in the 36 uh, threshold. If the non-renewable part is less than 36.4, it can be considered low carbon. So it can be an energy that comes from the grid, for example. It's not renewable necessarily, but there's uh, an option there. If the emissions is greater than 36.4, this portion is not certified. And in case of renewable energy, if it's greater, this part is not certified as well. So, so it's not considered low carbon. It's not uh, certified even though it's renewable energy. From the other side, if there is, uh, if it's not lower than 91 and it has no renewable energy, it's not classified. If regardless of all of this, uh, it's a mix that allows less than 36.4 uh, CO2 per mJ, it can be classified as uh, low carbon. So that's how it's the decision tree goes. So at the end, it can be low carbon, but not certified, or green, but not certified. Next slide, please. So now considering the delegated regulation of the European Commission, there are two regulations, right? Like Mikey mentioned, I'm going to talk about the first one of them, which uh, talks about the conditions for renewable energy. So accessibility, Mike already mentioned it, but I'm gonna shine a light on the criteria for Brazil uh, and how it's being discussed here in our country. Uh, Self-production, we know that the average time of implementation in Brazil is uh, for uh, wind power and, and solar energy is lower than 36 months. So that issue related to the 36 months, uh, it's okay for, uh, our, for us to comply with here in Brazil. There's some other uh, criteria related to the grid that are very specific criteria to design that is for the design of the European grid and they're not applicable to Brazil. However, we know that in Brazil, the electricity requirements uh, regarding renewable electricity and emissions can be achieved in several locations in Brazil. For example, the Northeast region. So for Brazil, apparently we'll have no problems with this uh, accessibility criteria. Let's go to the next one, please. Next slide. Additionality. There's also the issue of the 36 month period, which I just mentioned, which the average implementation time here in Brazil is lower than that. So there's no issue. And also there's issue of support and subsides. Uh, we understand that there are no subsides for investment and operation of 
renewable energy plants here in Brazil. These plants, they are part of bids. Uh, they are there are no subsides uh, that are specific for this case. So, as possibly we will have uh, in all other countries for hydrogen, but for renewable energy plants, there is no uh, subsides here in Brazil. Next slide. Regarding the geographical correlation, like Mikey mentioned, uh, there are issues related to the binding zones. This also applies to the European Union grid. In the Brazilian case, the geographical subsistence that we have here, which are, let's call, uh, subdivisions, uh, but it's not a thing with the borders, with the defined uh, borders in Europe, but most of them uh, have great potential for renewable energy. We've seen in the map that Maurice just showed that there is great potential for renewable energies. In addition, uh, our transmission lines are very capillar, like uh, Maurice just mentioned. Next slide, please. Okay, so now the, the time correlation. The temporal correlation is the criteria that we consider that is going to be the criteria that's a little bit more complicated because it benefits uh, uninterrupted uh, sources. And, and these sources will have some sort of issues to comply with this criteria. But I mean, uh, this includes uh, the certification has been uh, defined for Brazil. It didn't define the time criteria. It defines a monthly, an, uh, excuse me, an hourly criteria. It defines a monthly criteria. It's going to be really difficult to, to have this uh, uh, power purchase contracts, uh, sale on the spot market. So these are things that need to be developed. It's not impossible, but there, there will be a big challenge here. And the challenge here with, to, with the European certification mechanisms to reach uh, a point that can be beneficial for Brazil as well. So my last sentence here. So in general, it seems that this uh, criteria from the delegated regulations will not pose any problems for Brazil. Like Mikey mentioned, there are things that we need to adjust and things that we need to discuss, but that are already foreseen uh, in, in, in the other stage that was published right now. Uh, so I think that, I think it's, it's okay. It's under control for Brazil. Uh, I would like to thank you. Sorry for the rush here. And, and I'm at your disposal if you need me for any clarifications. Okay. Thanks, Adeli. Thanks, Mauricio. Uh, so we received a few questions. Many of them have already been uh, answered during your presentation, but due to the time, we're going to have to forward the questions to you uh, offline, and then we can answer, answer. the participants uh, in our chat room. So now I'm going to invite our uh, our, our, our colleague Mauricio uh, and Adeli to, to have their final words, and then we can uh, go to the next uh, speaker, Ricardo Gedra. Mauricio, any final considerations? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the invitation, and second, I'd like to say that finally, we have a very important opportunity for Brazil, uh, not only for the internal market, uh, I mean, we need to consider the internal market of hydrogen, but also to support these companies uh, to produce uh, these products that have a, a lower uh, content of CO2 and, and GHG gases. So thinking about exportation is important, but also thinking about the production of hydrogen here in Brazil for the internal market so that Brazil becomes strong with this new hydrogen economy. Thanks, Mauricio. Perfect.
Adelie would like to do any final considerations for our participants. Now, I would like to thank uh, your invitation. It's great to, to be here and it's a great seminar. And I'm here at your disposal uh, for any discussions uh, with the uh, trade uh, chamber or any uh, any player who's uh, who needs to go deeper into the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Adeli. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Giselle, for your participation. Now I would like to invite Ricardo Jedra uh, for the Chamber of uh, Electric Energy uh, Trade and also in the Consultative uh, Council of the Green Hydrogen Energization. The floor is yours. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Zeka. Uh, I thank you for the invitation for the presentation. Uh, can you see the presentation on your screen? Yes, it's already on screen. Okay, perfect. So thank you for your kind uh, introduction. I uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in this event with you, all of you. So I'm gonna bring you a few updates of what's been discussed about hydrogen certification here in Brazil. And uh, just to let you guys know the background, uh, CCA is in the governance of the electric sector here in Brazil together with ONES. Uh, ONES operates the physical market, CCA operates the trade market. Uh, under the uh, NL and the public policies defined by the Ministry of uh, Mines and Energy, and also EPE, a uh, partner of us, which works uh, strongly in the hydrogen uh, market. So that's the context of CCEE developing this initiative. And this work started in 2021 when CCEE talked to several representatives of the whole chain in the sector of energy. Uh, Giselle also uh, participated with, with a lot of contributions for this work. And hydrogen was considered as a trend by everyone. And electric power and certification was considered a key input within this context. So CCEE, uh, whose goal is to develop innovative, sustainable, uh, energy efficient markets in benefit of the society, the society wanted to get this uh, information to develop the certification because this would take advantage of measurement contracts and registration of all plants that we already have in operation in Brazil. So all of this is already existing in our market and it could be optimized with the certification because this is uh, most of the information required not complete information but most of the information required for the certification so it would be a quicker process and a more effective process with high level of confidence in terms of auditing and tracking and so on and this development is something that needs to be done together uh, and that's why we created a work group last year with representatives from several uh, links in this chain, uh, the power generators, uh, the factories, and the companies that consume hydrogen, and the academics uh, uh, sector as well, gas and manufacturers, which most of them produce hydrogen or are uh, converting their processes to produce low carbon and hydrogen, and also representatives from the government and different sectors like ANAEL and EPE and so on. And this uh, culminated in the launch of the initial version of our certification in December 2022. It became public and was made available to the market as a first version, as an initial version. And I want to make clear here that is the first version just to start testing. People who work with innovation, they work with uh, a concept that it's, it's not the most complete version we've seen in, there's not a consolidated standard, but this is just to, to start supporting pilot projects in this field, to run these tests, like Giselle mentioned, the research, uh, have some of the same purpose. So within this context, we'll launch this initial version. And I'm gonna mention here, what is this initial version, what the future will look like, depending on the evolution of this regulation. So today the initial version uh, only covers a hydrogen certification, but it should include ammonia in the future, which has been used a lot as well. 
uh, being with hydrogen as an input and other uh, derivative products that we use hydrogen as an element but the idea is not the idea to certify uh, steel for example there's already a steel but as when that steel doesn't go into the furnace uh, and burns uh, coal to burn hydrogen then we will have to deliver the information to have this uh, environmental attribute with this steel. So the production route is electrolysis, which is the first one, but we want to widen this uh, according to the directives of our country, uh, which Brazil focus on low carbon, but we can't do everything at the first moment. So we start with this route, but it's going to include other routes according to the market needs and uh, what is accepted internationally as well. The emissions, uh, only indirect emissions are uh, verified in principle coming from electric power production. And there's a part that is renewable that has no carbon associated. And, but this will be increased uh, for scope one. If you know this uh, inventory of emissions, you know this uh, terminology. The uh, scope one comes from energy, and scope two comes from the processes. So this will be included as well. I'm going to discuss this a little bit more. I just wanted to talk about the, uh, and also about the life cycle with the borders being defined according to the certification schemes and recognized internationally. The modes, uh, 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 this will include producers uh, that produce energy is connected to scene uh, with contract like PPAs in English. Uh, with the hydrogen producers might be a self-production which already exists in the country and also an off-grid uh, system like has been commented uh, before we will have this option as well and we will evolve as required by the market and the national and international regulations this depends on these factors currently we only have a pdf report but uh, we have a token and blockchain with traceability and for future needs, it will be interchangeable and so on. Uh, currently, in terms of temporal correlation, we have a quarterly or monthly model because this is the standard for Europe for September 22. And that is why this version was launched in December and it followed the last valid version at the time. The version that Mikey uh, presented today still requires approval by the par uh, the parliament so so our rules will evolve according to the regulation if europe defined an hourly uh, measurement and people want to certify with the european standard they will have to do it hourly so the certification scheme certification is one thing and the certification scheme is a different thing if europe the european uh, mar uh, market defines that it's an hourly uh, we'll have to be certified as hourly to export to, to Europe. As of now, we're uh, been following Red 2 version of the European uh, regulations and the evolution uh, with the advance of PNH2, like Patricia mentioned in the beginning of our seminar here, they already defined some uh, requisites. And this must be of interest of companies that produce hydrogen and derivatives here in Brazil. Currently, it's a manual process, but it's going to be to become a system. The cost, there's no cost now, but to have more re uh, requirements like blockchain, automated system, and do you have some costs in the future to implement these technologies, um, which will be incorporated into the system. Currently at the CCE uh, webpage, you can see here uh, an, uh, a page that shows more details about the subject. If you are interested, please access. And now talking a little bit about the future, what's ongoing here and what are the next steps? I'm going to detail that a little bit. So we include direct carbon emissions, which were not being included uh, as of now, but they will be included and be part of the process. We're going to have an alignment with the National Hydrogen Program, PNH2 in Portuguese acronym. There will also be uh, an international discussion uh, regarding uh, 
this aspect of certification um, who also adapt to the new regulations of Europe as soon as it is approved. And like Mikey mentioned, April or June, depending on any uh, delays. Uh, also this year, we'll start the erection of a technological platform, the creation of this plat technological platform, uh, because we are gonna need it to be quick to is issue certificates for each production batch. So this really needs a, a technological platform to be able to run it and with tokens and so on, this will be implemented. In addition, there are some works, the ongoing works for the first projects in Brazil, the pilot projects here, uh, they must be disclosed uh, for research or the first uh, in commercial scale are being implemented. And we've been doing this work to already certify these first projects using our current version of the certification. And like was mentioned before, we want to comply with H2 global requirements so CCAE together with Aga Carrillo and we developed an open letter for the companies here in Brazil who are participating in this uh, purchasing process with uh, Germany. So we're giving all the required support to uh, allow uh, these companies that are participating, if they, if they win any bids, they can get the certification in the international standards and comply with all the requirements for Germany. So these are the main actions. I'm going to discuss the first, the four ones, these four ones here. Uh, the, some of them had already been discussed. So I'm going to go real quick so that I'm not too repetitive. Regarding direct emissions, uh, it's already been discussed about the importance of the carbon intensity of the hydrogen. And th therefore we need to define uh, some aspects that include not only the whole productive chain, but also what is the emissions within the process. And there are standards and companies that are specialized with this uh, scope. I'm bringing you a few one to illustrate here. IPHE, Brazil's part, uh, the Brazilian uh, Hydrogen Association represents the country there with the definition of requirements and to allow to the assessment of carbon intensity for uh, it, hydrogen produced by many technological routes, the uh, Tuv Sud, Tuv Ryland, uh, Certif High, who's already been discussed here by the GSL colleagues here, a good European reference. Japan and uh, UK, there's an ISO standard that's not specific for hydrogen, but it's a standard that checks the footprint carbon of any products, of any product. The computer I'm using here, for example, it can any product can be assessed. And hydrogen can be one product that can be assessed by this ISO standard. So there are some standards that are not directly uh, uh, applicable, but can be applic applicable as well, and the GAG protocol as well. And what we've been doing is CCE knows, has all the knowledge about the electric part. And here we're gaining knowledge with the of the productive process, analyze how it works in all the certifications, and they do an immersion into the process and all the data of the process. So this is an additional work. So the idea here that is being in development, that will be a complementary work. The scope two uh, of direct emissions depend on monitoring of the whole generation over the whole country. And the idea is to complement with this, uh, just a few examples. This is something that needs to be developed as well. Just, just a few examples. And the fact is that it will be complemented by the direct emissions mapped by processes and certifications that are internal to the country and that are recognized internationally. So for the H2 Global Work, for example, they mentioned ISO 14067 standard. So if a customer says, oh, the standard will be X. The idea is that to have this measurement standard of carbon intensity to be recognized, for example, for those who want to export for Europe, for example, you have to follow the definition of, of, of Europe. And with the advance of the hydrogen prog program, this will be developed as well and added. I think this is the message that I wanted to share with you and which standard will be accepted, possibly several, depends on, on the customer. So just to wrap up um, with that, we're gonna have a 
wider and more encompassing assessment. And also there's an issue with the borders, if it's within the process or if it includes transport, for example. This will be included in the certification scheme as well. Certify already it, uh, defies uh, borders and so on. This is related to the certification scheme. Uh, the National Hydrogen Program has also been mentioned here as well. It has six axes. The first uh, five axes here, uh, and within axis four that Patricia just mentioned here, uh, there's uh, the legal framework here, like CSL just mentioned. There's a public consultation now. Uh, it started last week. So now the works have been started to really assess the contributions and implementation. And within this, con this context, we're following it up to, to do all the implementation required and meet all the requirements uh, for the Brazilian program. And here I think is the last thing that I'm going to discuss here, uh, because the European scheme has already been discussed by our colleagues. So what are the important works that we need to do here uh, to allow this certifications to be uh, uh, recognized internationally. So CC uh, leads the work group, the SIGRE work of group. Uh, this group exists for 100 years. It was uh, founded in Paris, has representatives all over the world. And this group has been discussing this certification standard and they will have some recommendations and to try to harmonize all the standards. Uh, we also participate of the advisory committee of the Green Hydrogen Organization, also trying to have international alignment with these organizations. The Green Hydro Hydrogen Organization has a certification scheme. And the idea here is to try to look for the greatest synergy possible within all of this, of this context and try to harmonize some requirements that are key uh, requirements. And one of them is the custody model. The book and claim model, uh, which the environmental attribute is not related to the physical attribute and the mass balance, which is when these are together. So there are different schemes that uh, within the several standards we have in, around the world, there are standards that was book and claim and there, there are schemes that we use, uh, certification schemes that use the book and claim concept and certification schemes that use the mass balance custody model and they are not fusible so it's essential to have an harmonization regarding this aspect all over the world in addition carbon intensity uh, it's already been presented by Giselle and by Mikey as well the, the admissible thresholds by the EU regarding carbon intensity and other countries use different thresholds uh, the Green Hydrogen Organization uses a threshold of one kilo of CO2. It's a different threshold. So there are different thresholds and each of them uh, have a specific identification and so on. So it's important to have some harmonization, including the technological routes that are accepted uh, and, and uh, electric ge uh, power generation sources. Also looking for international recogni recognition and traceable certificates. So that's it in terms of internationalization. I'm going to discuss the part uh, additionality, temporal uh, correlation and geographic correlation because this has already been discussed. Uh, I'm just going to emphasize that this concept of 90% renewable energy in Brazil in 2022, we have 92% of uh, uh, energy, renewable energy being uh, produce some renewable sources. We, uh, this is a very important landmark for Brazil that that prevents the need for temporal or geographic correlation. So this is really important for all of us. Well, that's what I wanted to present you. Uh, if you have any doubts and you want to receive any information about this uh, subject of a certification, please send an email to the address on your screen and you can get some information about the subject as it's here as a work group that is working on this initiative and we can share this action and this information with everyone. Um, so Zaka, that's it. Uh, now the floor is yours again. Thank you, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Ricardo, for your presentation.
Thank you for broaching one of the questions that we already had in your in the chat room regarding achieving 92% of renewable energy, which really allow us to 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 be the ex, to to be exempted for the next five years. This is great news for Brazil. Uh, we got several questions here, and like to ask one of them because it's a question that has an opinion. So. The question is, what is your opinion regarding the maximum uh, capacity of renewable energy? Why is this discussion about this requirement is so important? Well, I think that Mike already discussed this. We're talking about the European uh, standard and Europe today. Uh, the lower the small part there is a uh, clean electric energy generation if they don't have new clean appliance uh, probably these plants will have to compensate this with the with this energy and that's why the context that's why they're discussing this but brazil is not different uh, we're gonna have to deal with this aspect as well. We might have a different context here. We have an opposite uh, context here. Most of our generation is already clean. So in terms of opinion, I think that we need to follow the European standard. Here in the Brazilian context is different, but we need to follow the international standards. So if you want to sell to Europe, for example, you need to follow the European standard. Uh, but if it's a different market, then we're going to have to follow a different uh, reference. Excellent, Ricardo. Thank you so much. I would like you to invite you now to to have your final considerations for our participants here. So we're here at your disposal uh, to collaborate with anywhere and clarify about this information. For the Brazilian industry. Perfect, Ricardo. Thank you so much. I thank you so much. More than 160 participants on YouTube channel. And I'm telling you that the presentations will be available and all the recording of this webinar. Everything is recorded and it's possible to get it. And I hope we have answered your questions during the debate. More information about Certify is on our first webinar of this series. You can access on the channel AHK Rio de Janeiro, the full event of the first webinar with the participation of the presenter talking about Certify. And I pass the microphone for the final consideration. Eulen Martins Lachi of the National Agency of Oil. Eulen, welcome. The microphone is yours. Thank you so much, Zeca. I'd like to thank JZ at AHK for this important event. This webinar has a very high level of discussions, very clarifying. And I'd like to start reminding you that Brazil has lots of different renewable energy sources. We see hydroelectricity, wind and sun energy. We talked about fuels, biomass, ethanol, biodiesel. biomethane and now as patricia mentioned in the beginning there is this concern of the country and the media of mines and energy with the project with hydrogen why is this hydrogen so important because we have because we have so many other sources of renewable energy the main aspect the sources of energy are not competitive, they are complementary. And the brilliant presentation of Mike, she highlighted that Europe needs 
of the green hydrogen. So we need to use this window of opportunity to develop the industry of green hydrogen, not only because we are going to need this fuel internally, but also and especially for export purposes, external purposes. And it's fundamental certificate. It's important so we can have hydrogen part of the programs like Hanova Bio and similar programs monetizing the, the economy, decarbonization. And it's also important to have within ANP a discussion that we have about hydrogen and AL as well. What about the thresholds of the agencies regulating green hydrogen? This is a very important need. We need to regulate the production, distribution, transport, consumption. And then we talk about the quality of different sources of hydrogen for different certificate. The certificate is present in all the requirements. And something really interesting presented by Mike and this need of Europe, specifically Germany, green hydrogen need made Europe he started this aspect of certificate program our hydrogen according to the criteria about time and geographic correlation. The hydrogen that we have started producing. It could be part of the criteria and certificate of Europe. And it's interesting when Mike showed us, Red 2, the definition of biogas, our hydrogen can be part of it because biomass on bagasse specifically, and also glycerin the big amount of glycerin that we have as a byproduct of biodiesel production. Most of the times we have associated this and this could be an interesting use. Mauricio's and Adelie's presentation, it was interesting to show how we are adjusting the Brazilian market will not have difficulty in energy to increase and produce the green hydrogen. We are not going to get our energy source dirty because it's renewable. We can guarantee that our I hydrogen is sustainable without difficulties. And Ricardo's presentation, very interesting with this harmonization, international harmonization, we are developing here criteria for the Brazilian certificate in PN2, the, led by Patricia. I was part of the meeting of strengthening of technological aspects. And there is a very interesting então, space for discussion, this discussion on how to develop the certificate to meet our interest and it's in accordance with the international certificate. So we can be part of international market of hydrogen as a big player. Some markets are ahead of us, like Chile, our neighbor, that have similar conditions to us. Ours that's been presented before, Maurice and Lee, about the price of green hydrogen and Morocco también, as well. So it's about time to develop a national industry of hydrogen, green hydrogen, 
eh, oriental, que fala que grandes bênçãos não bem aproveitados podem se transformar em maldições. Espero que a gente tenha a sabedoria e o direcionamento para que a gente consiga aproveitar e navegar nessa onda. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, Wilma. E com isso a gente finaliza é, a parte aberta ao público do evento, é, aos participantes que foram convidados para participar das salas temáticas de discussão. Eu peço que vocês acessem o link do Zoom que receberam por e-mail. Nós vamos continuar as discussões nesses grupos reservados. Muito obrigado a todos os participantes e espero que vocês tenham é, Aproveitado Enjoy muito bem. Até mais. Bye, bye.